Yo, this hot, this the spot, there it is, pod.com. We're interviewing the best comedians, so tune in quick and get your ears receiving them. We're talking about life and life to stream right to you from the microphone right to your home, dude. Side note, this might get embarrassing, but no, don't sweat, yo, because there it is. Welcome to the There It Is Podcast, a comedy podcast for creators of any variety. I'm your host, Jason Farr. Let's do this. Yes, this is a comedy podcast for creators of any variety. Here's what that means. Primarily, we focus on comedy and creating comedy and how to do that. But... If you are an artist or creator of any kind, I think you can still learn from the process that is described by the guests that we have on that are primarily comedians. However, some are musicians, like today's guest is a musician, and we talk about a lot of fun stuff, including touring and things like that. And I think if you're a comedian, you can get a lot from this discussion because we're talking about things that are a shared experience between musicians and comedians. So good podcast episode to listen to. And if you are not a comedian, you still can gain something from the old episodes and this one. So thank you for listening. Thank you for giving it a try. I want to talk about something that is bugging me right now, something I'm seeing on social media that's really annoying me. No, it is not about Sean Spicer being on the Emmys. Um, I'm torn about that because on the one hand, political figures, even if they're polarizing, being on a comedy show, not a new thing. Smash cut to Nixon on Laugh-In. Suck it to me. I don't know if you get that reference, but nevertheless, I'm still not talking about that particular instance uh, or how annoying Sean Spicer might be. Uh, I'm going to talk about something else, and it's bad Instagram comedy. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. Here's what I'm talking about when I talk about bad Instagram comedy. I'm not talking about Instagram comedy in general. I'm talking about a specific portion of that comedy world on Instagram that is bad and it's bad because it's not well constructed it's not thought out it's not produced well it's overproduced uh, in many cases it's poorly acted or overacted and it's just not good it's just not good and it can be bad that's fine but what annoys me what I want to rant about are the people who are of that ilk who are bad in that way, who happen to have some success, they just have a bunch of followers on Instagram, and they act like they're conquering the world, and they just got lucky. They just put stuff out on Instagram like anybody else does, and then they're calling themselves CEOs. I've seen that. Someone called themselves a CEO, and what do they have? They have an Instagram account, and they have a YouTube account. Do you know how many people have an Instagram account and or a YouTube account. The number's out there. I don't know. Maybe you know. But my point is, it's bad, and yet they're arrogant about it. And they're arrogant just because of the ego of saying, well, I have a lot of followers. I have millions of followers. And then you look at their videos, and they're not funny, and they don't have that many likes. (laughs) So I'm just like, well, how can you talk like you're so special? It's just annoying. It annoys me. And, uh, you know, you would think I'd get off of Instagram, but I'm not. I, I'm going to stay on. I'm going to hate watch the bad comedy, and I'm going to love the good comedy and the musicians. Which brings me to today's guest. Today's guest is a musician from New Zealand. Her name is Emily C. Browning, and I found out about her from Instagram. And she is one of the people doing Instagram right, okay? She is not going on there and putting a couple of things up that's not really strong and then talking a big game about how great she is, right? Uh, That's what some of these bad Instagrammers are doing. Which, by the way, be weary of anybody 
who is putting out a bad product, got lucky, and is still doing well, yet they are talking a big game. Good people put in the effort, not in branding themselves or talking a big game. Good, legit people put in work at their craft, at their artistry, at getting better. And the byproduct of that hard work, the pieces of work that they put out, that's what they put out, and they let that speak for itself. That's the right way to do it. That's what Emily's doing. Emily has trained. She's good. She puts out original videos on YouTube. She puts out stuff on Instagram of her playing. And it's good. And it's great. And I saw it and I was like, oh, I'm going to start following her. She's so good. And she was going to take a trip from New Zealand all the way to New York City. And I said, well, I got to go see this show. And it was a great time. And we talk about that. We talk about touring. We talk about her music. And we talk about New Zealand. And it's a really fun chat. And I hope you enjoy it. Here is my discussion with Emily C. Browning. Okay, you're in New Zealand. That's pretty awesome. Uh, I, My previous knowledge to New Zealand was that Lord of the Rings was shot there. Yes. And, um, and Fight of the Concords. And that's yes. the extent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Lord is from here too. Oh, uh, who is? Oh, Lord, yes, Lord is Lord is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's three um, things that I knew about New Zealand. I mean, there's more stuff, but that's the oh, the, the thing that the, you know most people need to know. I'm a dumb Apart American, from- and uh, <laughs> so I don't know all the like these great things that there are to know about New Zealand. Um, <laughs> I did meet somebody who's, I think, from New Zealand, and I uh, was a little wrong about her accent and thought, oh, are you from Australia? And that didn't go over well. No, that doesn't usually go down well. For me, I'm usually a little bit lenient because um, it's not... It's not as if you guys are surrounded by Australian and New Zealand accents, so it's kind of fair enough for you to get that mixed up. Right. <laughs> but, it, um, but sometimes I get... Uh, messages from people saying, oh, how is it down in Australia? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> close, but not quite. It's so, so close. More over. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, people don't know. Uh, <laughs> people need to learn. Need to it's all right. Them. We are, but New Zealand is literally surrounded by water in the middle of nowhere. So, I mean, it's, right. it's cool. <laughs> um, have you lived there your whole life? Yeah, um, most of my life. So I grew up here in... Um, in my city called Christchurch, um, mm-hmm. just in a little small town a little bit north of here called Kaipoi, and um, spent most of my life here apart from six months when I did actually move to Australia, and I did pick up a little bit of an Australian accent while I was over there, so it was kind of funny uh-huh. back here, and then um, people going, you sound different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, that born and bred here. You know, it's so you're you're from Christchurch, New Zealand. Yes, that's yeah. funny to me only because when I hear Christchurch, I'm from uh, the Bible Belt of South Carolina. So when I hear Christchurch, I assume you grew up in a church. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you grew up in a town called Christchurch. Yeah, I mean, you you can't force the whole of the town to be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Like you know, there, there are obviously churches here, but it, it's. Do you know why it's called Christchurch? Is because when it was settled, it was settled by the British, and um, that that's that was their thing at the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. region is called Canterbury, which is also a region in in England, and like it's all, most of the place names here are either um, of British descent or of Maori descent, which is Maori is the um, the native. Uh, native people here in New Zealand. So um, when the British settlers came along, they had to kind of um, uh, coexist with the native people here. But when they did build the city of Christchurch, they did make it incredibly British. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, 
And you, as you mentioned previously, you're surrounded by water in New Zealand, yes. <laughs> um, in the middle of nowhere. So, uh-huh. so first though, how long have you been playing music? You're a fantastic jazz guitarist. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. I wouldn't actually consider myself a jazz guitarist. Oh, it's interesting. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I apologies. Oh, that's all right. I'm, I'm like I'm flattered that you think that. Um, uh, I went to. Um, I went to school for jazz, but it was, uh, I'm trained in vocals and anything that I play on guitar is just like what I, I learned something in a theory class and then I decided to apply it to guitar. It doesn't mean that I had like intensive jazz lessons or anything. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay. Um, and so do you consider yourself like a, a pop artist or a rock? Like what are you going for? Yeah, I, I would, I would say that I'm going for pop mostly mm-hmm. because I'm looking to, um, to be in the popular music stream. So rather than call myself a jazz musician, I would rather say that I am a pop musician um, for the sake of the fact that I like I like pop music and I like very simple four chord songs mm-hmm. and I like um, I like catchy melodies and like really uh, strong driving hooks. Um, and I would like to fit in with the mainstream and I would like to be on the radio and I'd like to have you know like music videos on whatever the music channels are these days. But, uh, uh-huh. yeah, that's kind of the goal for the future is to be a pop artist but to incorporate elements of jazz and incorporate elements of maybe soul and blues and um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all and of I that. I hear that. Yeah, I definitely hear that you're incorporating elements of soul and blues in your music. And that's one of the things that really struck me about you. I, um, as, as I mentioned to you before, I saw you on Instagram. And uh, I was like, oh, she's really great. And uh, then got to see you perform in New York City when you had a little trip here. And and you were playing a wide variety of stuff. You did a, a Maroon 5 song. Uh, you did a John Mayer song, which, by the way, you, were, you had done a couple of covers. And I was like, oh, gosh, I would really love to hear her do a John Mayer song based on like how your playing had gone. And you ended on Neon. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I was blown away. Uh, that that this like internal wish came true, but also you did a phenomenal job with it. But there's this, oh yeah, it was so fun. And there were these different styles of music. You you even did a song by Blackstreet. You did No Diggity. You know, like how were, how did you find this music? I mean, like the style of music that you play and and everything. How did some of these songs? These, I understand and know that American music makes its way around the world, but how did you know about No Diggity? <laughs> <laughs> no Diggity is a staple. I, it's like it, it, even here, everyone knows it. But um, really, that's awesome. For yeah, Teddy Riley, sure. that is amazing. R and B is huge here. Hip hop and R and B. No clue. Big thing. Um, uh, so when I was. Growing up in in the early two thousands, um, when I was kind of just starting to go to high school and all of that, um, a lot of the stuff on the radio was um, uh, musicians like lots of TLC and like Ashanti, J Lo, um, uh, Destiny's Child. Mm-hmm. All of that kind of R and B was like all over. We we were all over it as a country. We loved it, so we we soaked it up. So, um, like I've got a lot of songs in my set that um, that kind of almost pay homage to that time in my life. So I do oh, okay. a, I do a TLC cover and I do a mm-hmm. Destiny's Child cover and like <laughs> and Maroon I was tied into that as well with that song This Love that was like. Honestly, anytime I play it, every single person knows all the words, and it's. Oh yeah, I mean, even people did the. Uh, it's all right. Like they, the, someone threw that out there. Uh, yeah, because of there's <laughs> that callback moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I yeah. tried to do the and no diggity when you did the well. I tried to do the wow wow, but no one no one else was on board with that. <laughs> Oh, was that you? I think I, I think I picked you out. I think no, I, I have video of that, and I because <laughs> that was when you did Neon, and, uh, uh, and then you threw that in there, which is amazing. And I, I was like, I'm the only one that knows the well well in this room. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I was, I was, 
that. So thanks for that. <laughs> oh, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you for acknowledging my nerdiness and knowing that, but uh, and actually doing that in the show. <laughs> Not a problem. So that's cool that like there's this music that's playing there. Um, I, I mean, I had no clue that. Uh, I mean, I guess I could imagine a more recent song, like you know, a, a Maroon Five top forty hit playing somewhere else. Like I, I get that, but No Diggity being this '90s song, I mean, that's cool <laughs> that R and B is so big there. Yeah, it is. It's very big. Um, yeah, hip hop is huge here. There's a kind of a, a subculture that's um, related to like Pacifica music as well. So in New Zealand, we have a lot of um, a lot of Tongan, a lot of Fijians, um, Samoans, and Maori people as well. And they, um, uh, I think, um, as uh, as far as hip hop and R and B goes, I think there's like a Pacifica community that's adopted that. Um, that kind of genre of music and changed it up a little bit. So we, um, there's, there's kind of a new spin on that and it's kind of, um, it's hard to describe. You'd have to, you'd have to listen to it. But, um, it, there's a lot of New Zealand bands that, um, that come from that era of, um, of nineties hip hop that have, um, adapted it and turned it into something else and taken elements of reggae and ska music and, um, like, uh, very, uh, very kind of chill, relaxed, but that same kind of like rap driving uh, um, kind of beat behind it. So um, yeah, it, there's a lot of uh, cool music to come out of New Zealand that um, that I've noticed to come from that kind of um, house genre. Not house, but look, you know what I mean, like that. Uh -huh. The roof, the roof is what I'm trying to say. That kind yeah. of um, yeah, the bass. The umbrella. <laughs> The umbrella, that's the yeah. word that I'm looking for, not house, because that can be taken as a completely different genre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. House music, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's really great that there's all these different influences that you're getting to experience there and you're incorporating that in your music, and I'm not surprised to hear it having seen you perform. And I found <laughs> out about your show because of the Pickup Jazz Instagram account. And yes. uh, deserves some uh, acknowledgement there because I'd already known about you and uh, and they popped up in the feed and I said, oh, uh, they got Emily on here. What's that? <laughs> you know, like well, I have Emily Browning on here. So I went and <laughs> saw that you had a show coming. I said, oh, well, I got to go to that show and mm -hmm. then started following that account. It's a great account <coughs> to find other uh, really great artists that are out there and uh, they're, they're doing a great job keeping jazz alive. Um mm -hmm. So you were traveling. Uh, was this your first time to America? Uh, no. So I, ha I have been to America before a few years ago, but that was for um, a wedding, not mm -hmm. to do with music at all. I just kind of um, hopped around a little bit and, and then left. But um, it is interesting that you mentioned pickup jazz because um, the guy who, who runs that, who curates that, um, his name is Sam Blakelock and he's mm -hmm. from Christchurch as well. So, um, him and I actually studied at the same, uh, music school, but he went through a few years before I did. So I never actually met him in the flesh here in New Zealand. Oh, um, wow. yeah, so that was, that's, it's an interesting kind of full circle thing because, um, yeah. uh, the whole Instagram buzz started because, um, I, uh, Sam's a songwriter. He writes very cool, um, guitar, mm -hmm songs um mm -hmm. i've seen his stuff he's good yeah and i i covered his tunes once um just in a little instagram clip and i sent it to him not really thinking much of it i was like oh hey man i, I really like this song i've just made a cover of it have it have a look and he's like oh that's so cool i'm gonna share it on the pickup jazz page so this is <laughs> before i had any real followers so as soon as he shared that um on pickup jazz i i managed to grow my following almost like overnight it was ridiculous it was yeah. like i got to like a thousand followers in a couple of days and then it just kept uh, like skyrocketing from there so basically i um kind of said to myself well i've got to ride this wave now <laughs> so, <laughs> so what i did was i just kept posting tried to up my game a bit get better lighting better like bought a new phone <laughs> oh. um better yeah, better songs and um, more singing and stuff. So, um, and that's kind of how the Instagram thing started. So now it's just kind of snowballed into this big thing that I have no control over, really, because it's um, 
<laughs> it's kind of a life of its own. Mm-hmm. So, so, so you mentioned that you found pickup jazz and connected the two because that's that's where it all started that's, for me. Um, oh, that's great! I did not know that history before you just mentioned that because I. Um, I had seen a couple of pickup jazz things, but I hadn't seen. Uh, I didn't realize that there was a connection there, and then until they posted that. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So, what precipitated the trip over? What, what, did Sam have something to do with you making this trip and doing these shows? Indirectly, yes. So um, after after I kind of realized that this was a serious thing, and like there are, there are lots of real real life people who are interested in my music. Um, I tried to figure out where all these, most of these people were from and a lot of them uh, were American. So, and especially Los Angeles and New York. So, um, and you played in Los Angeles as well. Yes, I did. So, um, I pretty much said to myself, well, there's so many, so many of these followers in America, um, that want to actually see me play. So why don't I just book a flight? So I booked, booked my flight, um, to America and then said, right now I have to book some shows because I'm committed now. So um, ended up playing four shows in total, two in New York, one in Nashville, and then one in Los Angeles. Grueling tour. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, a lot of people, they travel so much. They, they might travel all over the country, but, I mean, you have to fly all the way across the world, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then you get here to New York and then you have to fly across the country that you just flew, flew to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> traveling, yeah, traveling can be pretty grueling. Yeah, I, I, I actually got really, really sick in the middle of the, um, the whole trip. So um, oh. the, yeah. the first yeah. two New York shows were fine, but um, I was kind of just because New York is such a like busy place. It's go, 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 and you've got to see all these things and meet up with all these people. Yep. So I ended up losing a bit of sleep, and that kind of wore me down. And then I ended up by the time I got to Nashville, I was. Um, I had the flu and strep throat, so... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I didn't know it was that bad. Yeah, it was really... It was terrible. So, um, in Nashville, I still decided that I really wanted to play this show, so I did. So, I played the Nashville show, but I had to cut it at... Um, I got four songs in, and I had to say, look, I'm really sorry. I have to... Um, this is this is where I drill the line, but um, yeah. luckily, I was playing for other bands, so they could um, pick up the sack a little bit and just start a bit earlier so um it was still a lot of fun and still lots of people showed up and said hello which was amazing and, and when still, you have the flu they understand they do yeah for sure people were really nice about it and um maybe but they didn't st- talk to you as closely after the show though i don't know people people keep their distance which which was really good um <laughs> but apart from that they still they still wanted to chat and say hey thanks for coming all this way which was really lovely and that made it so worth it for me so um yeah Absolutely no regrets. It was still um, an amazing, an amazing time. Yeah, it's tough. You know, touring is tough. There are difficult aspects of being a touring artist. A lot of people don't know. I have some friends who, who perform, and and one of them has been on the show before, his podcast before, and I've seen how it is for them to tour. And they, you know, they're just in a bus and they're just riding from one mm. place to the next, and and you yeah. really have to learn how to sleep and how to <laughs> eat. You know, I mean, it's got. There are definitely exciting things about it. I'm not trying to act like, you know, this is it's all sad. But it has its <laughs> challenges, uh, particularly when you're going to one country to another and you have this other culture as mm-hmm. well. Uh, the time zone. <laughs> yeah, the time changes and everything. And then, oh, gosh, your sleep is going to be completely out of whack. So, yeah. And then when you're on the, the plane, you're around all these people so you're getting a bunch of germs and you go to new york yeah. and you're on these people on the subway you know <laughs> um yeah so i found it wasn't that hard for me because I, I wasn't doing the two of us thing with um with lots of gear or anything um right. i actually managed to borrow guitars everywhere i went which was lucky for me because it meant that i didn't have to worry about carrying a guitar everywhere i went and um mm-hmm. put mm-hmm. that extra luggage but um the biggest thing for me was the time zone differences so uh getting from new zealand to new york was first of all a a 26 hour trip and uh on top of that i had to um get used to the new time zone but um but what i found during the trip was that i got really good at sleeping on planes so now (laughs) i've pride myself on being really good at that yeah (laughs) it was my saving grace really (laughs) i heard uh ben gibbard from death cab for cutie talk about 
uh, having to like like bands having to learn how to sleep on the road and how to eat on the mm-hmm. road, and mm-hmm. uh, you know it's it's a different ball game essentially. You really have to think about your next destination, so you've got to set your watch to the new time, mm-hmm. eat and sleep according to that time, so that by the time you get there, you've got that little bit extra prep behind you. <laughs> that's that's a good tip. And, you know, mm-hmm. comedians have to learn this sort of stuff, too, uh, if they're touring, yeah. especially stand-up comics. They tour so much. They have to mm-hmm. learn about, you know, to think about those sort of things. And, uh, I mean, not everybody is, uh, not every stand-up is on a tour bus going from city to city and state to state. But if you are so lucky as a musician or a stand-up, yeah, that's a really good tip. you got to think about, yeah. oh, that place is an hour behind, or we're going to a place that's two hours behind. Two hours yeah. <laughs> behind what I'm used to. So, yeah, that's a really good tip of just like already putting that that your your watch behind. Yeah, a little bit extra. But it's not as if I was <laughs> not like I was yeah. doing every night of the of the two weeks that I was there. I had plenty of time in between to rest and recover. So, I mean, I I know that a lot of people have it a lot worse than what I did. So, um mm-hmm. yeah, it was fun. <laughs> right. And of course like you know, it's all just the, they're all just aspects of being a musician. Mm-hmm. Did you have <laughs> any sort of fish out of water experience here? You had been to America before, so you'd sort of dipped your toes in it uh, at, to go to a wedding, which must have been exciting and fun. But did uh, coming here on this trip, were, was it just completely different than what you were used to, culturally speaking? Um, no, because... Uh, do you know what's interesting when when we grow up as um, New Zealanders in Australia um, we are surrounded by um, American culture and entertainment mm-hmm. growing up so all the movies that we see that come through the cinemas all the all the music that comes out and all the um, the language and the culture and the uh, yeah so the entertainment business spreads all over the world so um mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty pretty used to most things, but the, I guess there were a few little things that I did notice when I was over there, especially words that I would say that most people here would would understand what I mean, but over there, no one they go what? <laughs> what do you <laughs> <laughs> like? Um, for example, <clears throat> apparently saying "I reckon" is um is a southern a southern thing. Very southern, yeah. It's southern like, American it's... southern thing. People say, "I, I reckon <laughs> I'll go to the grocery <laughs> store late." You know, yeah, yeah. It was so normal here. It's just, it's not even. No one thinks twice about it. So, um, so I, I, I would say that there, and people go, "Oh, you're so cute. You're so southern." <laughs> Wait, they say "I reckon" all the time in New Zealand. Yeah, I reckon like. What? Oh, I reckon it's gonna rain today. You know, like. <laughs> oh, that's funny. There's yeah. a, a band out of Nashville. Adam Craig, he's a, a country artist. Uh, my buddy, one of my best friends, performs with him. He's a bass player by the oh. name of Jim Hendrix. True story. And oh. um, yeah, and they have a song called "I Reckon." Oh, really? so, uh, yeah, you know, so it's like very southern thing here. But yeah, you get out. If I, I'm walking around in Brooklyn, if I would say like, "I reckon I'm gonna go uh, to the bodega," then people would be like, "Well, what are you talking about?" <laughs> I understood one word you said, and it was I like, I had to kind of like maybe stifle that a little bit while I was there, just to not get the um. Sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fun. Uh, <laughs> you did a lot. We mentioned you did a lot of covers, um, and uh, it's so cool that you did all those co- covers. I'm fascinated by how a musician can both stay true to the original song, but also make it their own. Um, and I, I do mm-hmm. improv, I do improv comedy, so I think it's because of the correlation for me uh, of uh, that both improv and doing covers as a musician involve taking someone else's idea and elevating it while exemplifying who you are as an artist. I mean, it's like I said, you're doing someone else's work justice, and you're also making it your own. Um, mm. I, and I like that. So, how do you get to a place as an artist? where you can express yourself in someone else's work? Mm. Um, it's interesting being a guitarist and like a solo guitarist and a singer because when I play, especially the acoustic guitar, so 
um, I've, I've grown up playing the acoustic and accompanying myself as a solo kind of person. So what ends up happening when you do that is that um, you strum the chords, but you're also kind of um, partially playing the bass notes as well. You're also um, emulating the percussion with your right hand. Like um, if you're playing particularly percussively, you can kind of change up the rhythm a little bit. Um, I find that I have these um, two or three really like set rhythms like in in my stylistic being that just end up coming out no matter how hard I try to not sound like that. Do you know what I mean? So I'll, I'll play a song that um, say let's say there's a pop song that's played really straight. I, I can't help but put a little swing on it or put a little rhythmic thing into it. And um, if someone were to sit down and transcribe exactly what I do, there'll, there'll be a certain rhythm that they'll write out and go, this is what you play all the time. And I'll go, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to get sick of it. It's just, it's just who I am. It's just how I play. But um, yeah, so it's probably a part of, a part of that. So try to incorporate all the different instruments like, um, uh, so when I did play that this love cover, there's mm-hmm. the bass line that goes da da da, ba, da, da, mm-hmm. da da da. So there's that while mm-hmm. doing the comping chords. You've got to um, comp as well as um, play the bass line and put a little rhythmic thing onto it. So that's. The fact that I'm trying to do all three things at once, I'm really trying hard to multitask, somehow manages to put a different sound on the whole thing. So um, when I play all that by myself, it ends up sounding way different than the original anyway because I can't really help it. I, right. Sometimes when I try to play songs in the the original style, I really struggle because I'm so um, deeply <coughs> in, ingrained in my own feel that I kind of get lost in it sometimes and I can't get back to being straight or being um, being true to the track, which can be a burden in some cases. When you're, maybe if you're in a covers band or like, and they're like, can you just please play it how the track does? And I'm like, Great. So yeah, it's an interesting dynamic, really. It's a mark of being your own artist too, though, you know, I mean, that's, I guess that's a good problem to have. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm I'm not complaining whatsoever, and I think um, people <laughs> respond. People respond well to that. Clearly, through especially through the Instagram thing, people mm-hmm. seem to like what I'm doing. So, um, mm-hmm. might as well just keep. Doing that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of time has been put in in developing the style that you have. Yeah, I've been doing this for a long time, um, and I remember. Uh, pre-Instagram, pre-music school, pre-all of that. So I, I would always enjoy playing the guitar, but I remember um, I remember learning the song Valerie. Well, sometimes I go, I've always had that one. Um, and I remember kind of strumming it a little bit differently and kind of going, oh, that's cool. So I um, kind of stuck with it. And I think I think that's where that whole style kind of started out, trying to, mm-hmm. trying to just do something a little bit different, and then it kind of grew into this big thing. So. Yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned earlier that you didn't travel with an instrument, uh, which is, I think, even something Chuck Berry did. Like he would buy a guitar for his tour or something like that, and it was also a text write-off. I think he said something to that effect. It was in that Hell Hell Rock and Roll documentary, and I saw that ten years ago. So I could be a little wrong on those details, but he threw out some mention of of something to that effect. But on the show that I saw you played a guitar you hadn't practiced with, really. You know, it was someone uh, else's guy. I, I, was it Sam's guitar? <laughs> Sam's guitar, yeah, yeah exactly. I had to get used to it really quickly on the stage. Right, right. And that's one of the things I'm wondering about here because, you know, I'm sure there's somebody out there who's saying, well, one guitar, another guitar, you know, songs are the same, doesn't matter, it's all a guitar. But, I mean, the difference from one electric guitar to another is... How the sort of how to generate the specific sounds and effects that you've been used to. Of course, you know this, but I'm explaining to those people uh, who may maybe don't get it. So, what I would like to to know about, like when you're going into a show with those circumstances, uh, how do you manage? You know, like do you, do you just have to improvise with what happens? Yeah, so many. So many elements that 
uh, throw you in the deep end completely. So um, being in a new venue every night is is very difficult because you're you're really in the hands of the sound guy. You're in the hands of backline there is. So I never used the amp that I was using before. I don't know how to set the, the thing. So I just kind of picked it up, went, that'll do, and <laughs> just had to go. So um, And I remember... You probably remember this too. I was having trouble trying to figure out which um, which of the like which one was the volume knob, which one was the tone knob, yeah, whether yeah. So um, so I kind of had to fiddle around with that a little bit, but then eventually I went, I don't care. We just have to play. So um, <laughs> just sometimes you've got to rely on the tone that comes out of your fingers, not the tone that comes out of the guitar. So um, and it is a different experience, and it can be frustrating not getting the exact sound that that you're used to, but. That's all part of the fun. That's all part of the thing where it's like, okay, so the New York show sounded so different to the LA show because I was with a different guitar, there was a different crowd, it was a different city, it was a different vibe completely, and that's that's what makes it so cool. That's why I have so many um, very specific memories in each city because, you know, um, you just got to make the most of what you've got and just do it. Like, no point getting stressed out over the details if it just doesn't matter, you know? So, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you're right. like every guitar is very different, and I was prepared for that. And like things, things went wrong in mm-hmm. in the Nashville show as well. So there was a big um, buzz coming from the amp that was really loud, um, and the string gauge that was on the strap that I was playing was really thick. So I had to quickly like kind of get used to that really thick mm. strings and yeah. play the guitar differently. But um. Yeah, which yeah. a lot of people, if they're not guitarists, they don't realize, like, the different size strings. Mm-hmm. So there's different <laughs> strings, different body shape, different tone, different, like, amounts of, like, grit. So some guitars are really grittier than others. Some are uh, twangier, some are brighter, some are duller. So um, <laughs> you really just, it's a mixed bag. But by it the time I... It been interesting, up- though, to, like... Uh, sorry to cut you off, but uh, right. I, I just think it must be interesting to when you're experiencing that live in the moment to say, oh, well, uh, how can I utilize that? Or how can I just go along with it? Because this is what's going on and I have no other choice. <laughs> yeah, it's about that. You literally just have no other choice but to <laughs> solve it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. I, I, you were... So fun to watch, and uh, you know, you you had a couple of moments where you said like, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just you know, I've never practiced this with this guitar before." And we were all like, "Hey, you're doing great, <laughs> you know, like, it's fine by us." <laughs> yeah, I probably shouldn't. I should get out of the habit of apologizing on stage because people are like, "Shut up, just play the song." <laughs> you know, well, we weren't that way at least. Like, we weren't like, no. oh, "Just get over it." But uh, <laughs> I did get advice once when I was in radio and live radio at that. So mistakes happen. And uh, I was like being apologetic to the audience. And my boss was like, yeah, no, no, don't worry about apologizing. You know, like, just just don't ever do that. <laughs> like he wasn't chastising me, but he was just like, it's just not worth it. Just keep going. So I would I would love to get out of that habit because it's like it's unnecessary and it kind of get, it's, puts a different different aura on you that people are, are viewing you as so um yeah, yeah. so true <laughs> yeah and it's it it is what it is and if you just keep trucking through a lot of people won't notice it and then a lot of people who notice it will think it was intentional you know in some cases yeah. so yeah. they're just like oh wow you know like this is great <laughs> like either way they're just enjoying it so you know like shed Shedding that for live performers, shedding that apologetic, oh, I'm sorry, this is not going well, is the best thing for your performance. Just uh, mm-hmm. really embracing the moment is the best thing you can do. Yes, indeed. Good advice. Well, <laughs> well thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, we're, we've reached the end here. Usually we create something. I don't know what we could create, but here's something I do want to know um, or, or just like <laughs> get out before we move on. Uh, and in the in the episode, what are some of these phrases that are maybe popular here that you're like, what are you talking about? Or are popular in New Zealand and you were uh-huh. saying it here and people are like, huh? What are some, uh, can you uh, think of any? 
I'm um, amazed that a, that I reckon is such a, a common <laughs> one there, and I love I love no, that. No, I don't know. Uh, what is something that they say? Oh, there's so many. I just can't remember on the spot. One of my friends says, um, "Oh my lanta," oh, like my- as. Like, <laughs> one of your American the- friends says that. Yeah. That's funny. So my lanta <laughs> like, is. Have you ever heard of my lanta before? No, the, the, him it's saying it's a product it's, here. It's so uh, like, <laughs> um, it's a, it's like, uh, like uh, I don't think it's headache medicine. It might be like Pepto Bismol or something. Like I think it's something like for like if you have indigestion or something. Oh my goodness! And uh, and I guess people will say like, oh my goodness or oh my lord, and uh, mm-hmm. like the jokey way of having that same moment is to be like, oh my lanta. <laughs> it's funny that like when you say that I just because I wasn't brought up in that like I missed the reference because I I don't know the product and like I've never heard it like I just it completely goes over my head and I just don't get it <laughs> I feel like yeah. I need to surround myself with people who are saying all the time to go oh okay I kind of I kind of get that context but there is one thing that we that we say here that um uh is so when you say thank you, you might say cheers, like mm-hmm. hey, cheers for that. Like mm-hmm. it, here, it kind of got shortened to um, chur, so C H U R. <laughs> so if someone's like, if someone passes you like a glass of water, you might go oh chur, and that's it. <laughs> oh, funny. <laughs> Laziest oh. way of cheers. That's so, a um, New Zealand thing to do. Yeah, oh. I'm not sure it's Australian. I, I'm pretty sure it's um, <laughs> it's. Okay. okay. Yeah. If I'm ever in New Zealand, I'll know to go. Like, oh, sure. Did I? Sure. <laughs> and a, a, another thing we do here is, um, if, if you want to describe something, um, uh, you might put "as" on the end of it. Oh, that's cool as. Like that's sweet as. And you just don't finish the sentence. So. Um, <laughs> so oh, yeah. yeah. I've said it a few times before out of habit in America, and they go, calls what? Sorry, oh, sorry, finish. <laughs> and I go, that's it. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Because, like, here you'll hear a lot of people say, um, oh, it's cold as hell outside. And it's like, well, yeah. technically, <laughs> it can't be cold. Yeah. Is it 100 degrees outside? Uh, Is that what you think? But saying cool as and then not ending it reminds me of when uh, people would say, I was about to say. Like, that's a a common phrase. And some parts of America was like, I was about to say. And then they don't say anything else. And I was uh, (laughs) talking to uh, uh, my best friend, his little sister, who's like a sister to me, when when she was quite young. So she was very literal uh she was elementary school age and i she said something i was like well i was about to say and then i didn't finish it like cool as and she said Uh what were you about to say (laughs) sweet sweet uh right up on that she saw right through you i mean hang on (laughs) (laughs) exactly uh that little third grader well (laughs) <laughs> there it is thank you so much for being on the podcast you are fantastic you're welcome thanks for having me and it's been a, it's been my pleasure what a fun chat right and it was probably pretty easy to listen to such a good accent right new zealand accent pretty great uh, <laughs> big thanks to emily for coming on the podcast i hope you learned something from it i certainly did i i love that discussion so i'm really glad that i got to share it with you if you want to find out more about her or see her work, you can go to YouTube. Just look up Emily C. Browning, and you will find her channel, and you can just subscribe to that. Also, I mentioned I saw her on Instagram. Emily C. Browning, uh, if you go to Facebook or Twitter and you search for Emily.C.Browning, you will find her. So go to both and uh, like her page, follow her page. She's great. Don't forget you can follow us too on Twitter and Facebook at There It Is Pod and me on Twitter at Jason Far Jokes and me on Instagram at Jason Far Picks. Well, folks, until next time, be good to each other. 
The music for the theme song was created by Neil Brooks. The rap was written and performed by Nick Acevedo. The logo for There It Is was created by Jeff Prater. The There It Is podcast is produced by Jason Farr.